Hi, everyone. Welcome to the November 15th edition of the Timeform U.S. Forecast. I'm David Aragona, and I'll be joined in just a second by my co-host, Craig Milkowski. This week on the podcast, we're going to take a look at some lower-level stakes races, a uh, focus on some two-year-old races. There are actually a couple of interesting turf sprints, tur- uh, dirt sprints, I should say, taking place for the two-year-olds at Aqueduct and as well as two at Laurel Park on Saturday. Uh, we'll take a look at the major graded stakes race of this weekend, really the only one uh, at Churchill Downs, the River City Handicap on Saturday. And we'll travel to Delta Downs and Del Mar for a couple of minor stakes races that are taking place there that might be of interest. Uh, Craig, I know you sent in most of these races, and uh, we'll start with the one that you highlighted as I think probably the most interesting race we're going to discuss. That's the River City Handicap at Churchill Downs. I think it's just one of two graded stakes races being run this weekend. And uh, I thought this was a pretty, a race where you could take some shots because one of the likely favorites in here, I think the morning line favorite is Mr. Misunderstood. He won this race last year, though. I think he beat a weaker field when he did it last year. This seems like a more competitive spot. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, it's a deep field of 10. It's pretty evenly matched. I'd say it's a strong group for a grade three. And I'm not sure Mr. Mr. Mister Misunderstood is the, the same horse that we saw last year. And as you said, I think it's a little bit tougher race. Uh, I was a bit surprised there's no pace projector label for this race, which with a field of 10, we tend to get fast pace labels but not here. And I think Get Western actually has a pretty clear speed advantage on this field. Uh, the pace projector shows him with a nice gap back to second with Emmaus back in second. And he uh, Get Western also has some really nice time form U.S. speed figures. He's hit the 120 mark his last three races. Uh, I think the big question with him is the mile and an eighth distance. He hasn't won at that trip yet, but if he's ever going to do it, this would be the spot. And I, I do kind of like his odds because I'm against uh, Mr. Mr. Understood, as you uh, alluded to earlier. And even the second choice admission office, I'm not all that high on him. He did run a 121 speed figure last time out in the grade one Shadwell. But to me, that was kind of a phony figure. He didn't do any real running. It was a tight tight group uh he was he actually finished 11th and was only beaten three and a quarter length so i think that says a lot about that race yeah i was kind of curious about the pace projector because when i looked at all the running styles of the horses in the field i kind of was expecting to see a favors on or near the lead situation for uh benefiting get western though i think it's probably a field size thing because there's a field of 10 uh we're not um uh, characterizing it as that kind of pace situation. But I do agree with you that Get Western could be dangerous as the front runner here because none of the others really seem like they're going to challenge him for the lead. They're all real mid packer closer types, and that could give him a real advantage. Uh, I would definitely use him. I kind of agree with your assessment of the admission office. He feels like a horse to me that's going to take a lot of money in this race, maybe even go off as the favorite coming out of that grade one event last time. To me, though, he's just kind of turned out to be a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, I know that you can go two and three back and see that he beat, that he finished right behind horses like March to the Arch and Catholic Boy. They're okay. They're graded stakes level performers. But uh, I just feel like admission office has never really stepped up, up to that level that I think a lot of people wanted him to. So I'll use him defensively, but I kind of wanted to look elsewhere for value. I've got to be honest, a horse that really interests me at a price in this race is number seven, Bema's Boy. I'm not sure that Bemma's boy is definitely good enough to beat this field, but he feels like one of these Mike Maker horses that has just really improved since the claim. Mike Maker can be so good with his claims on the turf, and when he gets aggressive with these horses and starts running them in some races that are tougher than you would think they should be competing in, I think it's always noteworthy. And something happened to that Churchill Downs where he just totally blew the break and was basically eased. So if you just drew a line through that race, he's been just super dominant in his two last two races that he completed for Mike Maker, both in August and Saratoga and last time at Keeneland when he doesn't strike me as the kind of horse that wants to go a mile and a half, but he just decimated that field. And uh, he just seems like one that's in really good form right now has to take a step forward, but he's going to be a price in this race. Yeah, I, I certainly have nothing against that selection. I remember seeing him live at Saratoga. I was there for his race where he just absolutely destroyed a uh, pretty pretty tough claiming field. And the, the way racing is these days, there's not a huge gap between top-level claimers and, and grade threes, particularly on turf. So if anyone can get one ready uh, for a race like this, it's Mike Maker, uh, particularly in Kentucky. Let's go to some of those two-year-old races. Uh, Let's take the ones at Laurel first. Uh, Both of them are on Saturday's card, uh, the sixth and the seventh races. They're going back-to-back. The first one is the James F. Lewis for the Colts and Geldings. And uh, this race 
has a ton of speed signed on and the field looks really evenly matched to me. Uh, the one that comes in with probably the class edge over this field is the number five Tuggle. Uh, you'll remember him from this summer at Saratoga, uh, both for finishing third in the Saratoga special, but also for that unusual ride in the with anticipation when they decided to rate him uh, as the uh, seeming lone speed in a turf race. My question for you with Tuggle is, I know his dirt races look good and probably give him a slight figure edge over this field, but I always worry about horses like this. If they just kind of ruined him and doled his speed by trying to rate him so much on the turf, can they go back and to sprints now and will he have the same speed? I always worry about that. Yeah, I wonder the same. I'm, I'm kind of against Togo in this spot, as particularly at a short price. For the reasons you mentioned, he's had some really weird trips. Uh, who knows if he's ready to turn back the sprinting on dirt. Uh, his one win did come over a sloppy surface. Uh, he didn't he had a weird trip in the Saratoga special also, if I remember right. But uh, he's a horse I definitely want to take a stand against. And if he beats me, he beats me. And as you mentioned, there is plenty of speed in here. And this is one of those cases where I'm going to side side with the horse with the best time form U.S. late pace rating. And that's uh, number three informative. Uh, he just seems to be a horse that's getting good at the right time. He He's still a maiden, actually, but his figures are improving. He actually ran a career best 96 last time out. And. Uh, while the, the last couple races he ran in weren't total crawl fest up front, uh, they do show some blue fractions, so they haven't been ideal for a horse like him, and I, I just think it might be a good spot for a horse I'm going to take a shot with at a price. I definitely gave him a look. Uh, every Anytime you see a pace projector like this, I think a horse like informative is definitely one that you have to give strong consideration to. It is a big step up in class for him, just considering the fact that he's never actually won a race. He also still seems a little bit green to me. I was watching his last race and he just never changed leads. And that seemed to really sort of dull his leg kick, especially in the final eighth of a mile when he sort of flattened out. So he's got some things to work out, but I will say he's faced some pretty good horses. I mean, he got beaten by Independence Hall, who looks like one of the best two-year-olds in the country. So back. So it's not like he's been facing bad fields down at parks. Uh, I would definitely use him. Uh, a horse like Raging Whiskey scares me a little bit, though. I, I wonder if some others are starting to catch up to him at this point, because he was one of those precocious two-year-olds who did some damage very early in the year. Uh, I'm interested in both horses that are coming out of those waiver claiming races at Laurel. Uh, Bernie's on fire, as well as Sir Back and Black. Of the two, I do kind of prefer Sir Back and Black on the outside, uh, getting first-time Lasix for Richard Vega. I like the outside post position, uh, because the one thing I'll say about this pace characterization of the fast pace is uh, the horses that want to get to the front towards the inside, if they don't get out there, will have to take some kickback and could find themselves in a poor situation. At least Sir Back and Black showed the ability to stalk first time out, and he's drawn outside of the other speed, so I don't think his jockey has to really panic if he doesn't break that well. So to me, he's dangerous because he ran a respectable speed figure first time out. Also, the number one, Newstom. Uh, I'm not sure what to do with him because I know his debut didn't come back as fast as some of the other ones, but that was his only dirt race. And when you watch it, he was really visually impressive that day. And some horses have come back out of that race and really improved their speed figures in subsequent starts. So I get the sense that that Parks Maiden race that Newstone won in August is actually a lot better than it seems. And for whatever reason, they tried different surfaces in his last two starts. To me, he just seems like a better dirt horse. So I'm interested in him getting back on the surface. I just don't like the rail post position given this pace situation. <laughs> Yeah, I was against him just because of the rail post position, and his win did come against Pennsylvania bred. So while they have improved their speed figures, it is a little bit different quality competition. Uh, Sir Black and Black, uh, uh, Sir Back in Black, I'm with you. He was my second pick in this race. I like how he was able to rate off the pace a bit and even lost a little ground at one point, finished strong. So if I had to go too deep, he would definitely be the one I'd use in horizontals. Let's move on to the female version of this race, the Smart Halo, going as the seventh race at Laurel on Saturday's card. And uh, I think it's a similar theme in this race. The pace projector is not predicting a fast pace, but I assume it got pretty close because there still is plenty of speed in this race. And uh, I think there are two key speed fillies that are probably going to go out and try to jockey for position on the front end, those being the one, let's stay positive, and the number six, Summer Fortune. Uh, Summer Fortune may be the favorite in this race. Jeremiah Engelhardt may have 
have the favorites in both of these races at Laurel on Saturday. Uh, she won her debut at Belmont last time, going to six and a half furlongs, was just a rocket ship out of the gate, immediately opened up two lengths on that field. She got really leg weary at the end of that race. You could say that she had a right to because she was setting a fast pace, but she's going to have to take some more pressure this time because let's stay positive on the rail, looked really quick over, uh, back in the spring, and she kind of uh, backed that up last time at Keeneland. So I think something's got to give between these two. Yeah, I agree with your assessment of the pace. I think it's going to be quick. Uh, it, it would probably have a red, uh, the red fast pace label if I Chester Cheetah was a, a horse labeled as fair. Ill Chester uh, was labeled as a speed horse. Uh, that's something I'm looking into. She probably should be. But uh, once again, I, I'm probably going to side with the horses that come from off the pace. Uh, I'm not a fan of let's stay positive. I don't like that after a big win at Keeneland, she was entered for a tag second out, and she was claimed out of that race, granted, for $75,000. So, I mean, it's no chump change. But with the inside draw, I'm a bit against her. So, again, I, I look for the horses that, that had the best closing uh, numbers in here, and that was two co-factor and three lucky Trinity. Uh, I would say co-factor is probably the better filly. She, she's run the better speed figures. But I would definitely be checking the tote and take either one of these in here that I think are at a, a pretty good price. Yeah, I've got no problem with Cofactor. Uh, I thought she was kind of with the race flow a little bit at Keeneland last time because uh, it's funny. You see these races at Keeneland, uh, and it's just the constant theme through all the races that I think they ran at this fall meet where horses that went to the rail just seemed like they ran into quicksand and stopped. And one by one, horses seemed to alternate turns on the lead that day, go to the rail and stop. And I think Cofactor just sort of uh, got up at the right time, staying outside the entire way. That's nothing to, against her performance. I mean, she ran the race that she ran, and she's going to get the right setup in this race. Uh, I kind of thought Lucky Trinity might have had more upside, though. I liked her debut. I thought she did it very professionally. Uh, she obviously handled the Laurel course. I don't really hold it against horses when they run in those waiver claiming races as Maryland breads because they basically are made in special weight races, and we've seen some good horses come out of them. So I don't think that's a negative at all. So I tentatively make Luck Lucky Trinity my top pick. The one thing I will say about Let's Stay Positive on the Rail, while I agree with everyone, Everything you said about the pace and the fact that she was in for a tag, and I don't like the claim away from Wesley Ward. She did face males in both career starts, and this is her first start against females. And also, she was right down on the rail for that entire race at Keeneland last time. Not sure if the rail was as dead as some other days, days on October 17th, but it definitely wasn't good. And uh, I think that might have been detrimental to her performance. It's still going to be a tough situation for her, but I think her last race might be a bit better than it seems. Yeah, I agree. I actually looked. I was hoping to find uh, some some runbacks from that race, but unfortunately, just racing in 2019, a month later, nobody's run back until uh, Let's Stay Positive is going to race back. So I'm just going to have to take that one at face value, and uh, I'm going to be against her, but I wouldn't be surprised if she if she still ran very well in here. Let's stick with the two-year-olds and take both races at Aqueduct. One's happening on Saturday and the other on Sunday, but we'll do them uh, uh, consecutively. The key sense for the two-year-old New York bred Phillies is going on Saturday's card, the eighth race at Aqueduct. And, uh, this has a totally different pace situation than the two we just covered at Laurel. Perhaps uh, the pace projector suggesting that as the number three time limit, I made her the slight morning line favorite. Uh, she's obviously going to be tough if she runs back to that race that she ran at Saratoga in the Seeking the Ante. Uh, she took to turf last time in the Matron, but they're electing to go back to dirt here instead uh, against New York Breds in the key sense. I think time limit has a good chance in this race, given the pace characterization. I just don't totally trust her because her form's a little inconsistent. It's funny you use that word, don't trust her, because that's exactly what I wrote in my notes. I, I don't trust her at a, what's going to be a fairly short price. Uh, she's a horse that always seems to be getting leg weary late. I know there's not a whole lot of speed in here, but I, I do think she'll be kept honest. I don't think she's going to be allowed to loaf up front just going crazy slow fractions. So uh, of all the races we're going to talk about, this is one I – Probably wasn't all that super excited to bet uh, bet on, but at the odds, I was looking at your morning line. I think Playtone is, is a viable alternative. Uh, she showed some high speed more than, than she had shown in her first two times where she faced some very fast horses with – we have both her races coded in red as having fast paces. So maybe she is a horse who wants to just be up front and wasn't quick enough those first two out. And she was certainly really impressive breaking her maiden. 
Yeah, I like Playtone quite a bit in this race. Uh, she's going to be my pick in here. Uh, she's a horse that I've kind of liked a little bit all along. She was very green in her first start at Saratoga. Uh, risky mischief, the winner of that race. I know she came back and ran poorly in the spinaway, but she looked like a good one at the time. And Playtone was just badly lugging in throughout the stretch drive. She was really green. We saw some of those tendencies again next time out at Belmont on September 22nd when she sort of made an early move to challenge the leader at the quarter pole. And it just seemed like as soon as Manny Franco asked, her to take over she again got really green turned her head to the side was staring at the stands didn't want to go by that horse was lugging in and it really got her beat that day because she started running again only after she got passed by the winner Firenze freedom that's a race that i think has come back to be a little bit faster due to the fast pace uh than the final time figure might indicate and then last time out they made a slight equipment change. They put a shadow roll on her, and that just made all the difference because coming through the stretch, she showed none of that tendency to lug in. Her head was straight, pointed at the wire, and she really ran through the finish line for the first time. So to me, it just seems like she's a horse that's starting to really figure things out. Uh, she might have to stalk, but that doesn't really bother me because uh, time limit has shown that propensity to stop late in her races. She does have the speed to be forwardly placed, which I think is pretty important on the dirt surface at Aqueduct lately. And I just think she's the horse that's coming into this race in the best form right now. So, uh, yeah, yeah, good info on, yeah, good info on the shadow roll. That's obviously something that's not, not in the past performances. And that would certainly help explain her uh, big improvement last time. So we agree on that one, but we'll take also a look at the Sunday edition of this race, uh, the notebook for the two-year-old male New York bred horses. And this drew a pretty high quality field for just a minor stakes on a Sunday for state breads. Uh, the focus is probably going to be mostly on the number seven dream bigger who figures to go off as the favorite in this spot off a pretty impressive 10 and three quarter length victory in the New York breeders futurity at finger lakes last time. Although he's most notable, I think for losing to tis the law in his debut at Sarah Saratoga in what was definitely the strongest state bred maiden race that we've seen really anywhere in the country since tis the law of course came back and won the champagne and seems to have an outside shot at being the two-year-old champion in this country uh but uh dream bigger i know we lost his second start to a horse that's in this race but he ran well that day too he's got a set of speed figures that just makes him fast enough to win this race and i think he's going to be pretty tough though i don't want to take too short of a price on him yeah, I'm the same. I mean, I think he's clearly the horse to beat in here. He's, he was probably, uh, without a doubt, he was the best New York bred maiden. He actually went up to Finger Lakes and broke his maiden in that 200 and something thousand dollar stakes race up there by 10 lengths. But I'm not confident enough that if I'm playing horizontals, I'm going to single him. Uh, I might use Harris Bay, who beat him a couple back. Uh, he was a little disappointing last time out. And another horse that uh, interests me a little bit, uh, I'm going to assume they're going to pronounce this New York traffic. I, I'm sure that's what the NY stands for. Uh, I'll wait and see what Larry Coma says on that. But uh, he's a horse that actually broke his maiden at Parks, and he did so very well. Did it with the 104 speed figure, which would be competitive in here. And then last time out, he dueled with a Jason Service horse, Mischief mischievous Alex at Parks uh, and that horse went on the win by nine and three quarter earned, earned a gigantic speed figure of 116 that day so I'm going to give an excuse for that race dueling with a horse who, who just looked like an absolute monster that day before giving it up late uh, if you put a line through that one to turn back the six furlongs I think this horse can be competitive as well yeah, he was a horse that I gave a long look to, and I just wasn't sure what to do with. Uh, I would assume it is pronounced New York traffic. Uh, I liked his maiden win two back a lot, and obviously he lost Independence Hall in his debut, so those are really good company lines. He's a New York bred who hasn't yet faced New York bred, so those are all good things. Uh, his last race, I agree with your assessment about Mischievous Alex being a really nice horse. It just bothers me that New York traffic gave it up so soon. I mean, he seemed like he was out of horse by the time they ran three furlongs. Uh, I just didn't like the optics of that race he can obviously rebound here and this might be a slight drop in class uh i just i wasn't sure what to do with him breaking from the rail here i'll definitely probably use him somewhere uh the horse that interested me that might be able to rebound in this spot is munaki the number four for jeremiah Engelhart. uh last time out in the bertram f bongort regard it's not noted in the short chart comment uh but he actually broke about a length slowly that day and i think that really compromised his chances because he was a horse that led all the way in his debut at saratoga i thought he was very impressive that day winning off by 10 lengths not sure what he was beating but he just really did it 
in an impressive fashion. And then last time out, I think that start really compromised him because it seemed like Jose Ortiz was reluctant to ride him too aggressively after that, and they forced him to rate behind some slow fractions. Uh, I just don't think he ever looked happy that day, and the seven furlongs got to him late. I would imagine Matty Franco is just going to send him this time. I know the pace projector doesn't have him in front, uh, but that's probably mostly due to the fact that he was in that slow-paced race last time. I do think he's fast enough to make the lead from Dream Bigger in New York traffic, and uh, if he does get to the front here, I think Munaki's going to be uh, a horse that could pro- maybe pose a minor upset around 7-2, to 4-1. to one. Uh, but I agree with you about uh, Harris Bay as well. I, I'd use him defensively, too, because I think the cutback from the mile is also interesting. Let's move away from the two-year-old to discuss two more stakes races. Uh, we'll go to a track that I rarely handicap, uh, I'll admit, Delta Downs, uh, for the eighth race on Saturday there, the Delta Mile. Uh, it is the two turns around that bullring track. And uh, one familiar name in this race, I think, is the 10 Forever Mo. Uh, People might remember him from the Derby Trail, I want to say, like three years ago. Uh, But he's been competing in some optional claiming and low-level stakes company ever since then. Uh, He definitely comes in as the class of this field. Uh, I just question if he really has that will to win races anymore because his form's tailed off a little bit. He just has three wins now as a six-year-old. Yeah, I figured I'd throw you a curveball, throw a little Delta in there. They they used to run this Delta Mile back when they ran the Delta Jackpot. But when I looked at it, it's got a nice field of 10. Uh, For those who maybe don't play Delta very often, despite it being a mile race, uh, there is a very long run to the first turn. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock, you know, I wouldn't penalize too much for if you got a wide draw. But I agree with you with Forever Mo. Uh, I just don't think he's the same horse. He's a horse who actually ran second to Gunrunner in one of those Louisiana preps for the Derby. I, I forget which one, whether it was the LeCompte or the Risen Star. But uh, he just doesn't seem to be the same horse to me. Uh, the more I looked at the past performances for this race, I, I really like Steven's answer, who's 10-1 to 1 in here. Uh, he was claimed a couple starts back by uh, Ro- Robertino Diodoro, who obviously does very good with claims. He has romped in his first two starts for him, winning by a combined over a dozen lengths in those two. And he's won at longer distances before, so I don't think the stretch out to a mile is going to pose much of a problem. And he really looks like a horse to me who's just going to make an easy lead and be tough to run down. Yeah, I was looking at him and kind of wondering what that 10 to 1 morning line was trying to say, because to me, he looked a lot more logical than that, all of his last two speed figures, especially. I know he's coming out of some cheaper races and he was just claimed for 7,500 three back, but Robertina Dorno does really well off the claim. And uh, I know the pace projector is not really characterizing this pace as favoring any specific type of running style, but it does seem like he's not going to have to work that hard to get to the front, especially from this inside post position, because nobody else in this race is really a need the lead type that has to gun to the front uh so i think he's going to be dangerous in here i i I would use him uh the other horse that really interested me is the three-year-old trevilian on the number six uh just seems like the kind of horse that might really be finding himself now at the end of his three-year-old season uh i was pretty impressed by his win in the gold cup last time at delta downs over this course and distance uh probably not beating a field of this quality but he was wide around the turns just took over with a ton of ease uh won that race really nicely and if he repeats that figure i think he's uh, got as good a shot of anybody as winning this race Yeah, those are the two I really like in here. He would definitely be my second pick. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know how great the morning line odds are at at, uh, Delta Downs. I'm not really expecting to get 10 to 1 on Steven's answer. Uh, I would be surprised if if it was maybe half that is probably more likely just based on the connections and his couple big wins. But yeah, him and Trevelyan for me, definitely against uh, Forever Mo and You know, it's always good to look at these tracks. I'm glad I was able to keep you on your toes here. No, I watched a few replays and uh, (laughs) I was expecting to see some more trips. I I didn't I didn't quite get that. But these seem like some decent horses and I at least knew one of them from (laughs) long ago. Uh, Let's uh, talk about the final race we'll discuss this week. uh, The seventh at Del Mar on Sunday. It's the Betty Grable stakes going seven furlongs for the California bred fillies and mares. And uh, the slight favorite on the morning line is the number five, Mosey Cal, who people will remember from uh, just a couple of weeks ago competing in the Breeders' Cup Distaff. She was sixth behind Blue Prize Midnight Bisu. Uh, she is a cow bred, though, even though she hasn't competed against this type of company that often in her career. Uh, she's dropping back down to the state bred level. 
I think my big question about Mosi Cal is, is she going to take money just because of that Breeders' Cup distaff running line last time? And does she really want the seven furlongs? Because to me, she looks like more of a two-turn filly. Yeah, I actually kind of really like her in this spot. I, I think it's a perfect turn back from showing speed going long against better horses. Uh, she's run decent at seven furlongs, she's, but she's been up on the lead. And I think from this, uh, you know, kind of towards the outside post, she might be able to track a little bit more than she has in the in the past and her speed figures just make her look really strong. So she's going to be my top pick in here. Uh, we, there is that question of seven furlongs, but she just has a look of a horse that, that I think is going to love the turn back in this spot. Yeah, it could be. I, I really, I was on the fence about her because on one hand, you could say that she's just classier than these fillies. We did talk about it a little bit though, in regard to the Breeders' Cup distaff and how the kickback was so detrimental to horses trying to close. And uh, to me, the fact that she beat five horses in that race is kind of meaningless because she was out of the kickback for most of the race. And I think she had a much more beneficial trip than a lot of others that day. Uh, so I'm not really putting any stock in the fact that she ran in the Breeders' Cup last time. I know her race two back at Stanton to need to go in the mile would make her pretty tough in here if she repeated that speed figure. Uh, I just go back to that seven furlong race. She ran a Delmar three back and it, it doesn't point her out as being a strong favorite in this race. So I was kind of on the fence about her with going this distance. And uh, I thought show it, show it and mow it. The number one uh, might be a horse that gets kind of overlooked in this spot because her speed figures, they're a little bit lower than some others. Uh, I will say though, she, too, hasn't competed against Calbright Company in a long time. She's actually tried a bunch of graded stakes uh, going back to the summertime and the spring. And I just think she's a filly who's been overmatched a lot this year. And she's finally getting the kind of dropping class that I think she needs because her last two races against uh, Calbright Company, she actually won those. She was just a half length behind Mosi Cal in that seven furlong race back in August. There's a little bit of speed in this race. I mean, anytime you have a horse like Love a Honey Badger in the field, she just seems like one of these horses that blasts off and tries to go as fast as she can for as far as she can. So I don't think the pace is going to be slow by any means. Uh, and I could see it just sort of coming back a little bit to show it and mow it. And maybe she'd get the right trip. I get that some others have to underperform for her to win, but I thought she'd be a decent enough price. Yeah, I'm curious about the other two horses that caught my eye are the two we have in front in the pace projector, and they're both trained by Peter Miller. Uh, love, a, love a Honey Badger is the four horse. I think you'd have to have a, a whole lot of faith in Peter Miller to like this horse off her running line last time. She came back from a year layoff, showed a little bit of speed, and just backed up and didn't show much. So of the two Peter Millers, I much prefer Creative Instinct in here out of the two, and she would probably be my second choice. After Mo C. Cal, uh, she's a, her third race off a long layoff. She came back with uh, not much of an effort, got a 101 speed figure, and then improved last time winning an allowance with a, a 109. So as a horse who we don't show a whole lot of pace in here, that's going to be right up front and seems to be getting better. Uh, she would probably be another one that I would use. Yeah, the other horse that interested me a little bit is the number seven Queen B to you because she's shown the ability to sprint on turf pretty effectively and she's arguably more talented on the dirt. So kind of stands to reason to me, just looking at those two factors, that dirt sprinting might be right up her alley, even though she hasn't done it very much at all recently. And uh, this trainer, Andrew Lerner, has very good turf to dirt numbers. Uh, so I I'm not saying anything clever. She's not going to be one of the bigger prices in here, but uh, I thought she was one that fit this race pretty well also. So I I was kind of leaning towards one and seven. You went in a different direction, but it is that kind of race where I think you can make a case for a lot of different horses. Yeah, I think it's a really good handicapping puzzle in this one. Uh, a lot of horses have a chance on paper and, and kind of it's going to depend how it plays out on the track. So those were all the races that we had to discuss this week. Uh, obviously, we'll recap all of these races next week on the Timeform U.S. Pacecast when we look back at the weekend races. And we'll also highlight uh, the maiden and allowance winners that are particularly impressive, as we always do, as we did this past week. Uh, so, Craig, good to handicap these races with you. Hopefully, we gave out some decent opinions this week. Uh, as always, you can listen to the Timeform U.S. Pacecast and the Timeform U.S. Forecast on DRF.com, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcast, Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum podcast channel. You can get all of this content. So thanks for listening, guys. We'll be back at you on Tuesday with the Timeform U.S. Pacecast.